happening? Guess where we are? Millville Army Airfield Museum, home of the P-47 Thunderbolt. We're so happy that we could be here today. So why don't we go inside and check it out? What's happening? Where are we? We're at the Millville Army and Airfield Museum and this lovely lady's name is Lisa Jester. Hi Lisa. Hello. Welcome. How are you today? I'm doing good. Happy to have you guys here. Thank you so much for having us. We're really psyched and good. let me ask you what is your title? My title is Executive Director and I'm also the Air Show Director when we hold our Millville Wheels and Wings Air Show. Oh that's incredible. Mm -hmm. That really is. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the airport itself? Sure. Millville Airport, that's where we are. We, yes, you are. Millville Airport, <laughs> Millville Executive Airport. Mm -hmm. um, we're America's first defense airport. So 1,500 men and women actually came through this base. They learned ground gunnery training, and they flew the P-47 Thunderbolts. Okay. So our mission, which is so important, is to preserve this World War II history that all was you know, happening here. All right. When did they commission this airport for that purpose, or was it built for that purpose? In 1942, right at, you know, during, right after the war, the, air, the airport actually was commissioned. Okay. Um, we were very close to Atlantic City, and they chose this airport as a place to, to have the, you know, add as America's first defense airport. Okay. And, but before that, it was a private airport where folks, local folks with planes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long had it been an airport? That's, that's, I can't, that, kinda... I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Not Probably really since sure. planes were invented. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not the Wright brothers. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> the other brothers. Some on the Wright brothers. <laughs> There's yeah. some other brothers from Millville or maybe Bridgeton. Yeah. <laughs> and how did the, so eventually I'm assuming that the airport was decommissioned. Yes. Perhaps yes. after was, the war. It was decommissioned, and a lot of the buildings that are still here were used for apartments. Wow. Um, businesses okay. actually formed here. So there was a lot of history that actually happened after that. So when these buildings were built, they were made out of cinder blocks, so they were only created to last a certain amount of time. Mm. That's why there's a lot of maintenance that still has to get put into these buildings. Mm. Who came up with the idea of having a museum? When did that start? And sure. where did, what kind of collection was it at the beginning? Well, in the 80s, um, our original founder is Mr. Michael Stowe. He mm -hmm. was here from Millville. And um, Michael was a young kid. He had an interest in digging up artifacts around the airport. He started finding oh, different wow, things okay. from plane crashes that happened here. Right. And then he met with the airport manager at the time, uh, Mr. Lou Finch. And they said, you know, we would love to open a museum. So it was Mike Stowe's dream to mm. do this. And the rest, in a sense, is history. <laughs> um, we've been open here for 32 years. And, um, but like I said, Mike was the original creator and founder of our museum, but we had a lot of other people play a, a huge part right. in developing the museum where it is today. How do you go about uh, adding to your collection so that it's to the point where it is now? And folks, if you come here, which I encourage you to, because they have been open since July 7th, you know, please wear your mask. They take your temperature, it's very safe. There is an amazing collection of stuff here. You you will not even believe it. It it, it goes in a bunch of different wings. I mean, it's so voluminous. I'm frankly overwhelmed, and I'm a big museum nerd, and I'm just like, oh, I could spend about seven days here. <laughs> so, well, our, how, our what, artifacts, the collection, yeah, yeah, they pretty much, you know, people will call on the phone. Hey, you know, unfortunately, we had someone pass away. We found a big mm -hmm. trunk okay. in the attic or in the basement, and um, they ask if we're interested. So. Hopefully a lot of the items that they bring in are sometimes things we've never had before, right. so we can actually you know, put on display. Mm -hmm. well, we have a system that's called um, CAPS, it's a collection system, and we actually put everything through Past Perfect. We take photos, we bring mm -hmm. it in, um, one of my staff members will handle that and we'll position it in the case that is appropriate um, you know, to make sure that whatever is given is preserved properly for years to come. Right. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And how long from when it opened did it take to start building the collection? And, you know, it, it, was it dribs and drabs? And when people heard about it, they, they donated even more? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? That's what was the exactly process? It. A lot of people 
serve through this base. So a lot of the family members actually mm, heard okay. about us being here and what our mission was to do. Right. So obviously, then they, if someone passed away, they would donate the, the veteran's uniform or their, mm. their you know, guns or their artifacts and history um, of their logbooks, how when they served during the war. Um, we make sure that all of those documents are in acid-free sheet protectors right. and preserved. Um, but like, there's ejection seats. There's so much to this history. So much. Um, and especially what's behind you. I mean, this is a link trainer. It's a trainer. flight simulator. It's a flight simulator. And we have one of seven that are still um, left in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have an, a, a link trainer. And this is not the one I'm referring to. We have a flight simulator that actually still operates. And it's in an original link trainer building, mm -hmm. which is building 25 that's here. Mm -hmm. So it's another building that is open to the public um, by appointment only. And how would you acquire something like this? Where it's, did it come from? It's pretty much <laughs> word of mouth. Once people know that we're taking in donations, right. um, you know, we have a very strong board of directors. And as our founders started creating this museum, they heard about people who had things in storage mm -hmm. or just sitting in their backyard or in their basements. And, you know, they would decide to donate them That's to wonderful. our museum to make us grow. That's really incredible. Uh, is that plexiglass? Or is it glass? That this particular picture that yeah. is all surrounded by plexiglass. Oh, yes. that's really amazing. Yeah. Do you see that? It's a flight simulator, but made out of plexiglass. So you can see the instruments that are inside. With the wonderful model, I'm sure she doesn't really have any flying hours, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. It's a photo that we found, and we kind of try to capture the history. Um, that's really amazing. So. And you have a bunch of history about link training. Correct. Trainer. This is kind of just to whet the appetite of visitors when they yes. come in because we have a building that houses a fully operational one. Wow. So that's what's really cool about it. That is really cool. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about this wonderful machine? Well, these two connect. Oh, okay. I yeah. got you. So as, you're in there, as you're in there flying, yeah. this um, little concoction here kind of goes around. So it actually, you know, it does a flight path. Oh, okay. So, and this is, you know, how it's recorded and how well you did when you were up there. Because this taught pilots how to fly during dark conditions. So they mm. only had their instruments to go by. Mm, this is amazing. Yeah, you can see it says Link Aviation Devices Incorporated. Wow. We mm. have an aerial tow target that was from World War II. And there's a diorama that was done you know, by one this, of our... Yep, this, this is the aerial mesh. tow target. Yeah. The gun, much of the gunnery training, and I'm just going to read this, at Milva was done 10 miles out to sea. The bullets in the P-47s were all coated with a special paint, as you can see here. The colors, right. Yep, and each pilot that shot had a different color. So the target was towed behind another aircraft, oh, okay. and then the pilot would fire at the target, and you'll see different colors that are actually on this target. So then when they finally landed, it was they kind could, of like a game. They could they tell who, who got the target. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also read that... Uh, uh, the when they commissioned it, they had a target practice out in a field with like wooden tanks or you know wooden other structures that they would correct. That they would and that uh, was preserved. That is over at New Jersey Motorsports Park. Oh, okay. Yes, there is a original tow target that um, bunker that's out there where they practice. Oh, and that's that wonderful. was one of the things when they were being built. It was preserved. What what is this piece of metal back here? Do we know? It looks like it's a runway. Let's see, I think it's over here. It's actually a steel plank. Pierced steel plank. Yeah. And we have some of these out Marston under our military that. vehicles. Oh, okay. So the vehicles drive over top and it's protected from the ground. Oh, okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. That's yeah. wonderful. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about? Well, All we can continue stuff. to yeah. kind of go through. Obviously, these are very important parts of history. We actually. You know, they did the, these thunderbolts, which um, one of our board members has an incredible um, advertising niche. She's one of our founders as well, and she has created a lot of our thunderbolts and our newsletter that you have and that you see wow. that have been done over the you years. Know, Army Airfield, and it's during the war. Most of our docents, our tour guides, are World War II veterans that have been trained mm -hmm. by other World War II veterans. This That's is amazing. a World War II Swiss Army bicycle. I could see by the, the, Swiss, mm -hmm. the Swiss flag right here. It came completely disassembled. One oh, of our wow. volunteers, Jim Crispo, he's a big biker, and he put it all together within a few days. And um, 
That's we amazing. love it. We're like, wow, this is so cool. When the family donated it to us a few weeks ago, um, we said, wow, what history this is to this have is this. This is incredible. Look at the brakes and these things. Yep. got a bell. And I, I bet a lot of important documents yep. were and carried in you, these pouches. Do you know what's in here? I'm, I'm thinking that it might be a gun. But, correct, yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's kind of sort of the, the break, shape. You can see it actually goes down on the tire. Like oh, this is, oh, wow. Look at which, that. They're flat, but I didn't want to replace them because they're original. Right. Usually the brakes kind of come right. up off the side, but this one just goes right, yeah. goes right down. And what's nice about this place that I'm experiencing so far is that there's a lot of please touch kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're respectful and careful, yep. you can actually put your hands on something that's, mm -hmm. you know, 50, 60, 70 years old that someone actually used. Yeah. And that experience is invaluable. Absolutely. Instead of just looking at things behind cases yep. and just trying to imagine. We love and encourage people to do the hands-on, obviously, but there's some COVID restrictions right now. Yes. So now we can take as many photos as you like to right. make sure. So this is a radio display. We had a radio tower operator here during World War II. Uh, Mr. Art Eastwood was the one who actually did this he actually here. He lived in Millville for many years and met his wife, Evelyn, here. Unfortunately, he has since passed away, but his, um, his wife is still living. She lives now in out, of, in out, of, out of the state, but we do still keep in contact with her. So one of the cool things we love to do when we do have tours and students through, we actually um, have it into our, our, the frequency of the Millville Airport. So you can hear... What's going on? Yeah. I love it. So, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so pretty cool. And then as we go through here, this is something that um, we're very proud that we were able to acquire several jet teams for our air show. The Canadian Snowbirds, the Thunderbirds, the Air Force Thunderbirds, and obviously the Navy Blue Angels. We've had several of these jet teams here over the years. Um, our museum, the Millville Army Airfield Museum, puts on the Millville Wheels and Wings Air Show with the help of sponsors, the city of Millville, the Delaware River Bay Authority, you know, tons of police um, departments that actually come out and, and you know, help us support this event. But this is what keeps our museum going. Right. We are very fortunate to be able to have an air show as a fundraiser um, and have the profit that we do when it is successful. That's amazing. So you're not just dealing with the past and history and all that important stuff, but you have this, these air shows that uh, mm -hmm. are current and now and happening and a lot of people are interested in as a support network. Yep. It's like a, it's like a team, you know? <laughs> it is. And it's, it's amazing the amount of people that we bring into the Millville Airport, mm. I mean, from in and out of the county, out of the state. So it's, it's great economic boost for our entire city. That's amazing. How long have you been having air shows here? We've been having them for about 20 some years. I've been here for 15. Um, but you know, jet teams is what brings in the, the crowd. But we started the Millville Wheels and Wings so many years ago when it was just a few aircraft that would fly in. Right. So I'm not sure if we considered them air shows. Right. Because now we have to actually close um, roads down. We actually have to close the New Jersey Motorsports Park. There are two tracks to gotcha. allow us to actually have the jet teams. Because where they perform, there's an aerobatic box over top. So we need to make sure that that's vacated. And, and that's a and safe, has safe been, space. Yes, very right. cooperative to help us continue that. Oh, that's wonderful. I look forward to seeing uh, one of those in the future. Yes, we're scheduled for 2021 Memorial Day weekend. Okay. So not sure who our headliner will be yet, um, but we'll have some type of jet definitely perform and a parachute team and several other performers. So um, I noticed that there is a wonderful old Coca-Cola machine. Yes. <laughs> I know, we I see this, this engine over here. This. But I'm somehow drawn to the Coca-Cola well, I'm, I'm drawn because my dad worked for them for almost 35 years. No. So really? this was here on the base. And obviously we did get it running, but it's really loud. So we weren't able to keep it <laughs> operational. Um, luckily, my father donated several of these different items that actually um, you know, promote Coca-Cola. But this was here during the base. So That's you'll incredible. see the picture that was back, and there's the machine. Oh, look mm -hmm. at that. It's right outside. Yep. That's so cool. T-47 Thunderbolt was powered by a Pratt & Whitney engine, and we actually have one. Right. It's an 18-cylinder engine, and it's massive. We love when we have tour groups come in 
because they can see how large this engine is in comparison to, you know, other like things. Like a car engine, yeah. or like a motorcycle engine, which may only have one of these. This has so well, many. Unfortunately, this engine was dropped, so it became damaged, and it was donated by um, one of our board members, David Rain, who owns Paramount International um, Company that's here on the airport. So, we were, you know, this is such a great focal point for our museum. We're so fortunate to have this artifact here on display. Let's just talk a little bit about this ejector seat for a minute. <laughs> actually, it, was, it, it, it has a funny story. It was actually left at our front door uh, many years ago. and um, Someone ejected the ejector somebody seat. Somebody ejected the ejector seat and wanted to donate it to us. So obviously we put this really on display. Cool. And when we're able to, we'd love to have kids positioned in there and put the helmet on and even put the vest because um, it gives them a, you know, a feel of how it is to be in in an aircraft seat so um That's amazing. yeah so that this is, is really, really cool. cool that's very wonderful hey everybody we're here at the millville army and airfield museum and what is this incredible thing behind me it is a pratt and whitney r 2800 engine it was used in the in a bunch of different aircraft um it's really incredible. You could just look and see what an engine looks like out of an airplane and how big an engine needs to be to power an airplane. And on that note, we're going to read a book called Flight. It's by Robert Burley, and it's illustrated by Mike Wimmer. And let me just tell you a little bit about this book. Flight, loneliness, fear, danger, the courage to dream. Charles Lindbergh didn't know he would ever see Paris when he left Long Island early in that morning in May 1927. But he did know that he had to try. He had a dream, and he knew he had to make it real. He was just 25 years old. So this is a book about that first flight that Charles made across the Atlantic. Okay, here we go. It is 1927, and his name is Charles Lindbergh. Later, they will call him the Lone Eagle. Later, they will call him Lucky Lindy. But not now. Now it is May 20th, 1927, and he is standing in a still, dark dawn. He watches the rain drizzle down in the airfield, and on his small airplane... The name was the Spirit of St. Louis. Look at that airplane. I'm not quite sure it had an engine this big, but it definitely had an engine. Lindbergh is nearly as tall as the plane itself, and yet he is about to attempt what no one has before, to fly without a stop from New York to Paris, France over 3,600 miles away, across the Atlantic Ocean, alone. Think about that for a minute. He climbs into the box-like cockpit that will be his only home for many, many hours. He clicks on the engine. He listens as it catches and roars. A few friends are here to say goodbye. They are only a few feet away. And yet to Lindbergh, how far off they seem. They look up at him and wave, good luck. Keep safe. What a feeling that must have been. I'm going to show you the picture and then I'm going to read a little bit so I don't have to hold the book like that. Okay, so will the spirit of St. Louis with its over 5,000 pounds rise into the air? That was a big concern. To keep the plane even lighter, Lindbergh is leaving behind his radio and his parachute. I would personally take a parachute if I'm going over water. So a thought runs back and forth through his mind. It's still possible to turn back. He doesn't have to do this. And yet another thought that was even stronger. I've been waiting my entire life for this flight. So Lindbergh lowers his goggles and nods his head. Go. Men on each side push to help the plane roll over the soggy ground. The little plane bumps forward, gaining speed. The wheels leave the ground, then touch back. The plane seems to hop, taking its last bow to earth. 
and on the third try it soars aloft and it crosses those wires with only 20 feet to spare and the spirit of st louis rises in the air it's 7:52 in the morning new york time so he points his plane towards the atlantic and paris and that's 30 hours away 30 hours and no one has ever done this before he gazes down in the morning light how far off Paris seems across the long ocean. He plans to follow the coastline flying northeast and then he's leaving across the Atlantic. He knows that at this low height the plane glides more smoothly. The plane drone on, drones on and it cruises at about 100 miles an hour. At this rate he will have just enough fuel to reach his destination but only if he stays on course. So at 12.08, he flies above Nova Scotia, and just after 4, he flies above the coast of Newfoundland. At dusk, he looks down and sees icebergs. In his diary, he calls them white pyramids. White patches on a blackened sea, the centuries of the Arctic. He wonders what lies ahead. So the last point of land in North America that he passes was Newfoundland. And now he can no longer follow the land edge for direction. He is just going out into the open ocean. So he must chart his course carefully. Now he must cross the ocean, one of night, the ocean of night and one of water. So it's two oceans actually. And time for him passes slowly. It's almost nine o'clock at night. He's been in the air for 13 hours and he's completed about one third of his flight. So he moves through dense fog and suddenly he enters a huge storm cloud. The plane shimmers moving up and down. He wonders, can I fly above it? Slowly he soars up to 10,500 feet. Here it is clear and still, but very, very cold. He extends his arm outside of the cockpit into the air and feels stinging pinpricks. He clicks on a small flashlight and peers out. Heavy ice has formed on the plane's wings. He cannot risk his instruments icing up, so he points his plane back down. The fog continues, but at least the air is warmer. The ice begins to melt and he roars ahead and he still has 2,000 miles to get to Paris. 2,000 miles. So imagine being up there, space and time and deep, deep darkness. He's been awake for almost 50 hours straight. He is closer to Europe than America and there is no turning back. He feels the leveling of the wings and he lets out some breath because one of the plane's wing has started to dip crazily. And he repeats over and over to himself, I must not sleep, I must not sleep. Here high above the churning ocean, to sleep is to die. So here's some of the things that he does to stay awake. He leans his face near the open window to feel the cold air. He holds his eyelids open to keep, with his fingers to keep them from closing. He remembers growing up on a farm in Minnesota. Sometimes he takes a sip of water from his canteen. And he also has five chicken sandwiches with him. This is all the food that he brought. He eats nothing. It's easier to stay awake on an empty stomach. His body cries for sleep. He loses track of time. The night is endless and he's waiting for the sun to rise. So dawn comes slowly. Will this fog never end? He is 2,300 miles from New York and he has 1,300 miles to go to get to Paris. He feels completely alone in the world. He feels as if he were flying through all eternity tries to stay on course, but because of his constantly curving route, he is not always sure. Here and there, the clouds seem to break apart and he sees far below him the ocean. From high up, it looks like a great blue shaft with gray walls. Then he flies into the clouds again, into the unchanging mist. That was a beautiful picture. The day comes brighter and warmer Sometimes he imagines he sees land, but it's only the flickering shapes of the clouds. 
and water, 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 endless water. It's 7.30 in the morning and Paris is over a thousand miles away. Flying close to the water, he sights a porpoise and he spies a seagull. And then fishing boats. Something quickens in Lindbergh's blood. I guess he's thinking if he sees fishing boats, he can't be that far from land. So he guides the spirit of St. Louis carefully down to just above a boat. He throttles a plane and calls out a question. Which way is Ireland? He hopes for a word. He longs for a wave, a warmer welcome back to the fellowship of man. I don't know if that guy actually told him which way Ireland was. He was probably like, hey, how you doing? What'd you say? So he sees low mountains in the distance and his hope rises because land is near. He quickly unfolds the map. He's right on course. He just flies over the southern tip of Ireland. Cows graze on green hills. People in horse-drawn carts look up and wave. He could land in Ireland, but he decides to go on. He wants to complete his dream. It's 1.52 in the afternoon, New York time, as he crosses England. It's his 31st hour in the air. So he, he sees the glow ahead of him. He sees the lights of Paris. I'm here, I'm here. A great joy wells up inside of him. For a moment, he almost doesn't want the flight to end. So he loves the strange closeness to the clouds and sky. It's 4.32 in the afternoon, New York time, and it's his 34th hour in the air. From above, all Lindbergh sees are many, many small lights. Now he must concentrate on just one thing, the sod coming up to meet him. Like, where's the ground? So he doesn't, you know, plow into it or fly too high. The plane touches the ground. It bounces and rolls and hugs the solid earth. It's 1022 Paris time. The flight has taken 33 and a half hours. You see the people that were there to greet him? Eh. Bienvenue, Limburg. Oh, we're so happy you're here. Thousands of people are running towards the plane. For a moment, he's dazed. It seems to him that he was drowning in a great sea of people, cheering and clapping and raising them on his, raising them him on their shoulders. They pull him out of the cockpit. They they cry his name over and over again. Other. People began tearing pieces of the plane off so they could have it for, for posterity, which is not very nice, but you know, hey. More than anything, Lindbergh wants to save the spirit of St. Louis. His first words are, are there any mechanics here? <laughs> Finally, two French aviators arrive to help him and policemen guard the plane. Whew, thank goodness. They take him away from the still cheering crowd. In the airfield's hangar, he tells the story of the flight to the other pilots. How cramped the cockpit was, how alone he was, the long, long night. Meanwhile, unknown to Lindbergh, headlines all over the world read, American hero safe in Paris. Lindbergh is driven off to the American embassy. He answers more questions. He hasn't slept in over 60 hours. Finally, at 4.15 in the morning, he goes to bed. That was a well-deserved rest. When he wakes, his life will be changed forever. When he wakes, there will be huge parades and medals and speeches. He will be the most famous man in the world in the year 1927, and his name is Charles Lindbergh. Yeah! Ooh, would you make that flight by yourself? 33 hours? Mm, I don't know. It doesn't take that long these days. If you fly from New York to Paris now, it only takes about maybe about five hours. So before there were airplanes, people got up into the air via hot air balloons. And this is the story of the first air voyage in the United States, and it was in a hot air balloon. This is the story of Jean-Pierre Blanchard, written and illustrated by Alexandra Wallner. And if you're interested in this or any of other flight books, you can come into the library because this is a book you can borrow. There he is, Jean-Pierre Blanchard. Okay. Right. 
and it's from his perspective, so that's kind of cool. My name is Jean-Pierre Blanchard. I was born in Adelis, France on July 4th, 1753. When I was a boy, I dreamed of flying in the air, free like the birds. See, I'm looking out the window and seeing the birds fly. I tried to fly them like them too. Even though I was not successful, I never stopped trying. Look at him, he's holding two chickens up in the air. <laughs> Maybe that'll help. And this chicken is going cluck. And he had somebody launch him off of a seesaw. Un, deux, trois, go! But I'm sure he didn't make it very far. And um, they're talking, they're, these people are talking in French and they're going, I wonder what he's doing. Uh, hello, Jean-Pierre. And he's like, I have an idea, mom. That was all in French. Can you believe I can read French? In 1781, I built my Vassieux Vallon, which is a flying machine. It was a giant balloon with four big wings at the bottom. I operated them with a hand and foot levers. Imagine my disappointment when I try to demonstrate my new machine for my friends and it didn't work. He's face down in the ground going, okay. And sacre bleu, like, oh my goodness. And he's saying like, poor Jean-Pierre, you know. I don't know if he'll succeed, but he knew, however, that someday he would succeed because he kept trying and he kept building better balloon. In 1783, the Montgolfier brothers, Jacques Etienne and Joseph Michel, built a hot air balloon. They put a sheep, a rooster, and a duck in the basket and sent it up. That balloon rose 1,500 feet in the air and it traveled two miles in eight minutes. I was lucky that the flight was a success. King Louis the 16th and Queen Marie Antoinette and the whole royal court was watching. Some months later, two other men took a ride in the brother's balloon. They were the first people to actually fly in that balloon and he wished he had been first. I was so enthusiastic about flying, I wanted to share it with people everywhere. He built his own balloon and made his first flight in Germany at Frankfurt. And uh, the people in Frankfurt are saying, you know, good luck, Herr Blanchard. And he's saying, thank you. Going up was fun. Once I was up in the air, however, it was an adventure finding a safe place to land. Sometimes he wasn't so lucky. He landed in a pigsty. He landed in a tree. He landed on somebody's roof. He flew over Hamburg, Nuremberg, Leipzig, Berlin, Breslau, Warsaw, and Vienna. But my most famous European flight was crossing the English Channel. The flight was called the Eighth Wonder of the World. He started in England, he crossed the Channel, and he ended in France. Dr. John Jeffries of Boston flew with him. Altogether, I made 48 flights in Europe, but more than anything, I wanted to fly in America. Ever since the American Revolution, I admired the Americans' free spirit. I wanted a chance to fly where the people were as free as the birds. So on January 9th, 1793, I got my chance. I had arranged to fly from Philadelphia, the capital of the United States at the time, yeah, Philly. to Woodbury, New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey. Many people from Philadelphia and beyond came to watch. Some of them were important politicians and their wives. President George Washington gave me a letter that explained to the people of Woodbury who I was. Since I spoke no English, I was glad to have the letter. So in essence, this was the first airmail. And Rebel, a friend's dog, was to travel with me. So among those in, in, in attendance was Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Monroe, James Madison and Dolly Madison, Betsy Ross, Martha Washington, and George Washington. Everyone gathered in the yard of the Walnut Street Prison. And uh, he said, thank you very much, Monsieur le President. Cannons fired and bands played, crowds cheered as my balloon took off and rose higher and higher. Rebel the dog was quite nervous. The Delaware River looked like a ribbon. Clouds were like wispy cobwebs. 
I could have just enjoyed the ride, but I had agreed to perform experiments for some scientist friends. Probably taking a little atmosphere, gravity, stuff like that. Dr. Wistar had filled six small bottles with liquids. He asked me to pour the liquids and record, recork the bottles with air from the highest point of my flight. He wanted to examine what the air was like far away from Earth. Dr. Glenworth asked me to weigh a stone. On the ground, it weighed five and a half ounces. In the air, it weighed four ounces. Dr. Rush asked me to take my pulse at the highest point, which was 5,812 feet. My pulse up there was 92 per minute. On the ground, it was 84. After my experiments were completed, I enjoyed eating a cookie. <laughs> Rebel was happy to have a cookie too. So that was the first in-flight meal in the United States. Not only was there air mail and transportation of a doggy, they also had some food. We drifted into a flock of pigeons. Rebel barked and jumped high. A gust of wind tilted the balloon. Rebel almost fell out. Oh my goodness, but I caught her just in time. Oh, thank goodness. That would have been a terrible ending to that, to Rebel's story. The first dog in flight by itself. We were now over the woods of New Jersey and I prepared to land. I locked my equipment, which consisted of a thermometer, a barometer, second watch and small bottles, all kept in a box. box excuse me, I did not want anything to break. I looked for an open space in the woods. By now I had become experienced at landing and we touched the ground only with a little bump. I had completed the voyage in exactly 46 minutes. Do you see how he has an anchor here to sort of hold on to something so, to stop the balloon from going? I'm sure Rebel jumped right out of that thing. I had made the first successful air voyage in the United States. Rebel was happy to be on the ground again. Hurrah, nous l'avons fait! Look at Rebel. God, I would love to have seen New Jersey back in 1793. A frightened farmer saw me land and ran into the woods. It's the devil! <laughs> I could not understand what he was shouting. I wanted to show him the letter from President Washington. He's like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not the Jersey devil. Uh, other farmers came toward me. One of them read the letter. The farmers were quite impressed because they love their president. And he's saying, my name is Monsieur Blanchard. Je m'appelle Monsieur Blanchard. The farmers deflated the balloon and carried it to an inn. There they put the balloon on a wagon. I was given a horse to take me back to Philadelphia. Since the country road was rough, I wish I could have returned to the city in my smooth sailing balloon. <laughs> all right, I wonder what happened when he got back. Oh, look at all those bewigged gentlemen and ladies. When I arrived in Philadelphia, I went to President Washington. I thanked him for his letter of introduction. I had traveled by air from Philadelphia to New Jersey, thereby becoming the first air mail letter in America. I was the first person to fly in America. And Rebel was the first dog. Yeah, that was a great book. Woo! All right. So that's it for story time. Please stay tuned for the next exciting thing. And... Thank you for hanging out with us here at the Millville Army and Airfield Museum. Today's craft, we're going to make a paper airplane. And this book is at the Bridgeton Public Library. It's called The Paper Airplane Book by Seymour Simon. And in it, it shows you step by step how to make a paper airplane. So we're going to follow those steps today and we're going to make our own paper airplane. So what you need for that is a piece of paper. It can be just a plain white piece of paper. It can be um, a color if you want. If it's white, you can color on it and um, make the plane any way you want, but you just need a eight and a half by 11 um, piece of paper. So the first thing you're gonna do 
is you're going to take it and you're going to fold it in half long way. And you're going to press down really hard and make this line really hard. So you can use your fingernail and press it down. And then we're going to open it back up and we're going to, the very top of the paper, you're going to take the corner and you're going to fold it in right to that middle line that you just folded into the paper and press it down like that. So now it's a triangle that you have up here. Press that down. And then you're gonna take the other side and do the same thing. And bend it down. So your paper now looks like this. This will be the point of your paper airplane. So next, you're going to take this and you're going to fold this in again, all the way up to the top, like this. So you keep your point there. And then you're going to smooth it down. So see what I did? It was like this, and then I folded it over and smoothed it down. And since we did it on this side, we now have to do it on the opposite side. So we're gonna take this paper and fold it down like this. So you have your point right there, and then you're gonna fold it all the way down like this. And this is what your paper plane looks like now. Then you're going to turn it over. So we have the line down the minute, middle here, and then we have this big triangular shaped. And we're going to take this, and like we did on the other side, we're going to Fold this over. This can be a little tricky. Press it down. And then you're going to do the same thing on the other side. So your airplane now looks like that. So this is one side, and this is the other side. And then on this side where you have all these folds in here, you're going to bend it in half like this. And now you have your plane. And if you want, you can take a piece of tape and tape this right here together. Make sure the back wings are up a little. And this is what it looks like on the underside. And now you have a plane that's ready to fly. So you can make as many as you want and you can see which one goes the farthest. Have fun with your paper airplanes. Thanks, we'll see you next week.
Okay, I'm gonna try out my paper airplane right now. So I made sure the back was turned up a little. And I'm gonna grab it right here and just fly. I need to fix the nose, it got bent a little.